And I think the Wild West was a perfect environment for wrestling. Yeah. Because it really is the, this is how we settle things. You know, it's, yeah. it's men settling men issues. Like, you know, instead of a shootout, we've got the squared circle to do it in. I always found they like more realistic wrestling, whether it be just good, tight, technical stuff. And that's more what they like my generation, I think, because they turned on it with Brett. Yeah. When Brett was really, you know, the top guy in WWE, it's like, Calgary guys can wrestle. But even before that, when, you know, bad news and obviously, you know, uh, uh, the stomper and stuff, it was real tough men that fight. Yeah. But Stu just had the, the ability to hook these guys, and it doesn't matter how tough you were or how bad you well, were. Well, you know. the ability to hook guys is a well, slight, especially, slight uh, Come here, kid, let me show you yeah, this hold. I, I'm going to demonstrate this to you, and I just put your arm there, but I mean, you know. <laughs> When did you start meeting the Hart family? And, and I got to I gotta go to this. I did a, a flow chart, actually, because I'll, I'll ask you each one of them because there's so many. Stu and Helen had 12 kids. Yes. Eight boys, four girls. Eight boys, four girls. If I mention them, maybe when you first met them and what you thought of them. I still went out and uh, committed to uh, Hart Brothers Pro Wrestling Camp. <laughs> Which was an experience. How many of the Hart brothers were actually training at that point in time? There? Um, I met one of them. Okay. At, at that point, Ed Langley was Ed Langley. the guy that showed up every day, opened the doors, and yeah. had the 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 Stu Hart book of truth with you train this yeah. this day, you do these moves, and sort of the rule of thumb on how to run the camp. And I knew that it was just absurd that I'm teaching <laughs> the Hart brothers pro wrestling camp, but I. The back of my mind, I went, you know, I'm doing a better job than the kid that taught me. The building we trained at in Calgary, Chris and I, we, we were both trained the same time, showed the closed circuit pay-per-views when Brett yeah. was on top. And, and we were training at the time. They, the guy let us come to the, uh, the, the closed circuit. And it was a Royal Rumble and Stu and the whole clan came in. And we were like one table over from like, oh my, there's, there's Stu. <laughs> and he's sitting there and it's like, I'm watching him and it's, the Royal Rumble starts and it's like, he falls asleep. Getting Ed Whalen was a big deal because he was the local sports guy on yeah. the real news that covered all the real sporting events. And he had a lot of credibility. He was the guy. What did you hear from the old timers about Ed Whalen? Who, whose side was who on? I think, again, I think the heels were the ones that had the problem with him because he wouldn't sell for them. You know, you get out there to do the interview and it's hard to convince yeah. somebody that you're gonna go out there and, you know, kill people when the announcer's sitting there and he'll just completely blow you off and yeah. stand right up to you. <laughs> yeah. so the heels wanted to just smack the shit Let out Let me of tell you something, pal. Yeah, but if you smacked Ed, there's a good chance we lose TV. When he walks in the room, the atmosphere changes. That it's just everyone's sitting around and it's like everybody just sits up a little bit straighter and it's a little yeah. bit quieter. When news walks in, it was like, and it was like everybody's just news. And it's like everybody just seems to be, we need to just behave ourselves a little bit better. Dynamite Kid comes in and once again, an English star, but he, even though he, Stu was not pleased when he saw his size, he'd heard about, oh, this is the greatest wrestler we've ever yeah. seen, and he comes in, hey, you scurny little bastard, ain't you? But, you know, his talent was such that they couldn't deny him, and he started getting over, and they started creating a, the mid-heavyweight category well, I for think the that younger was, guys. I'm pretty guys. sure it was Bruce that scouted him at first, and I think yeah. that was Bruce's way to, let's bring in the most amazing small guy we've ever seen, he'll get over, and it'll help Bruce, because Bruce was a small guy. Right. It's like, we need to establish that small guys can be awesome. Here's the most incredible small guy I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and he obviously also feuded with Bruce, and you yeah. can't, you can't uh, not look great working with Dynamite. I don't know if Bruce had a winning formula. You know, I think he really was between a rock and a hard place of if we stick with our roots, yeah. we're going to be behind the times. But if we try to get with the times, there's just this big conglomerate here that's just going to roll over. So I think he was really hurt in that. Did the people, were they, were they getting too complicated or did the people get it? Did it help the match? I think they got it. And I think like anything, it's what you're grown up on. It's like the round yeah. system in Europe when I was there. And they they use the cards. To. Yeah, whatever you're educated to, you're taught. You know, Mexicans think lucha makes sense. You know, I think he, <laughs> I held the mid heavyweight title at one point in time and maybe they had been remade, but I think they had just took the one that Mucka Singh, Mike Shaw at 400 yep. pounds had wore and went, oh, this is the size of a belt. Let's make a new one. <laughs> so the mid heavyweight title was something that no one could ever wear because we were all small guys with 30 inch waists and we've got this 60 inch mid heavyweight championship. The Calgary Boxing and Wrestling Commission was run by Marks. 
that didn't understand the wrestling a business. A lot of commissions, there were political appointments. Kentucky was the same way in the 70s. There were political appointments, and you didn't have to have a boxing or wrestling background. Stu had died, and there was the open invitation to all the boys and stuff, and there was the big church and stuff, and they had set up a whole, several rows of the front section for the boys, and a separate room downstairs so we could go in and avoid all the people. There was about five of us that went. Everyone has a stew, or my kid went to school with Bruce, or my daughter, you know, had Bruce Hart as a, you can't, I don't, I don't care where you go, go to the grocery store. The lady ringing your groceries in <laughs> has either went to school with them, used to know them, their uncle used to wrestle for them. I don't care where you go. There's someone that still has a tie to the Hart family and Stampede Wrestling. Stampede Wrestling, in the end, was much like the life of its creator, Stu Hart. From the most humble beginnings, it would rise to great heights, fall to the depths of despair, then pick itself back up and carry on, over and over again. It would spawn a family of offspring that would rule the wrestling world. It would impact the lives of everyone it came in contact with. And most like Stu Hart, its stories and its history live on long after its death. That's the ultimate legacy of Stu Hart and the Hart family and Stampede Wrestling.